Hi and welcome to Spectral Evidence. Today we're going to take you deep into the bowels of the Higgins Armory Museum here in Worcester, Mass. I myself can't wait to get in there, so let's go. Hi, I'm here with Devin, who is the Director of Education here at the Higgins. Did I say that correctly? You did. Thank you for taking the time out to be with us today. It's my pleasure. Welcome to the Higgins Armory Museum. You know, I have been trying to get down here for years and years and years, and now, right before the end comes, I finally make it, and you don't know how excited I am. Um, can you tell us a little bit of the history of the Higgins Museum, and where it came from, and how it came to be? Sure. Uh, our museum was started by a steel manufacturer and collector here in Worcester, Massachusetts, named John Woodman Higgins. And he, as a young boy, always had a fascination with stories of knights and shining armor, and that probably influenced his role into getting into steel and manufacturing things out of steel. And he started collecting armor in the early 1900s. Of course, it, his collection ended up just in his household. It ended up in his dining room, in his study. And there's even stories that his wife showed up one day and found a suit of armor in his bathtub. And that was kind of the beginning of the end of him collecting armor and putting it at home. So he found, he said, you know, maybe I'll start a museum and show off my collection because I like sharing it. Mm -hmm. And he started construction of our building, which is one of the first steel and glass structures built in the United States. And it looks like a castle from the outside, made out of steel and glass. And you're standing right now in our, our great hall, which is our main exhibit hall, which looks like a medieval or Gothic castle or cathedral, straight out of Europe. And that was his intention. It's awesome. And we opened in 1931. And we're on the grounds of what was also his steel manufacturing. When he first opened the museum, it was a museum not just of arms and armor, but also of the the history of steel in the United States. So you got a tour of the museum and of the factory. Now, he wasn't just a collector. You were talking earlier to me about how he aided in the war effort in World War I. He did. Uh, as the United States Army at the beginnings of World War I was experimenting with bringing armor back onto the battlefield, most notably with helmets, they had gone to the curator of arms and armor at the Met down in New York City. And he said, you know, it's not just looking at the old stuff. We want to talk with a manufacturer who's actually working with, with, with sheet steel today, with sheet metal. Because, of course, the Army is looking not just for protection for their soldiers, but also something that's easy to produce and cheap. So who better than someone who works with this stuff? So he called up John, and John met with the War Department, and they experimented with different styles of helmets for the military, even way back early on. And we'll actually see some of those helmets? We, we will. We'll, we have some on display here. Excellent. Um, not to put you on the spot. OK. Do you know what the first piece of armor he had in his collection? I do, and we have a picture of one of his real early suits downstairs. We can take a look at it. Awesome. In fact, it was the, the neat thing about this one suit of armor is it was one that he could wear. Oh. So he was so excited when he bought it, it was in his size, that he put it on, but the, the pauldrons, the, the shoulder pieces, he put on backwards <laughs> because he was so excited when he got that suit of armor. Now only the picture? Well, we have the suit of armor next to the photograph. Oh, nice. Excellent. So Excellent. We can look at both. Okay, well, let's move to the museum, and I'm going to sure. rely on your expertise. Well, let's go take a look at a couple of my favorite pieces. Awesome. Which are part of his helmet or something and grab onto. In fact, if you look, his target's attached, actually screwed right in mm -hmm. to his helmet, so it's almost a seamless um, flow up, and that's to help guide the, the lance off him. Uh, there are different types of jousts, though. This one is called a joust of peace, where it's a suit of armor made only for jousting to do this job. In a joust of war, you'd actually wear your combat armor and do the same game, but uh, without all of those safeguards of the joust of peace. Interesting. So besides our Western European collection, we have a, a great collection of armor from around the world, from Japan to North Africa to India. And one of the, the, the stellar pieces in our Japanese collection is this conch shell helmet from the 1600s. And when you look at this, you have to remember that this shape is made 
originally out of flat pieces of steel mm -hmm. that through heating and use of hammers, the shapes are slowly teased out. So you look at the conch shell, each, each one of these is a separate plate, mm -hmm. and then the, the spikes of the shell are teased out with the hammer and, and shaped that way. Wow. You know, it's not, you know, today it's like, oh, you just, you know, you cast it that way or you, you put it in the press. This is all done by hand. It's you amazing. Can, you can imagine this when it was, you know, fully lacquered, covered in leather and cloth, how dramatic it was. Although I really like it just in the steel because you can see all of the detail that mm. went into it. And all of the work and labor. In fact, the, a really rare piece, not seen anywhere else outside of Japan. And a few years ago, we had the Japanese consulate in from Boston because he had never seen one before. Wow. It's impressive. It's really cool. Sorry. <laughs> you might want to come over here. So this is a pair of Persian leg armor from the mid to late 1800s. It was done purely for decoration or ceremony, but just as much skill and techniques went into this just for, for ceremonial wear. The neat thing about it, in the midst of all of those links of mail, are, are steel plates with engravings of fighting cats and wild hares. But if you look at them with a modern eye, they look like bunnies and kitties. So the education department here at the museum, we've nicknamed these the bunny and kitty pants. <laughs> so you have to picture this, this fearsome Persian warrior on horseback wearing his bunny kitty pants. Now did chain mail come before or after plate? Uh, much before. This is one of the oldest forms of armor. Mm -hmm. In fact, throughout Western Europe as well, the male armor was worn throughout most of its history. It's only the last few hundred years that you see your stereotypical male in shiny armor. And even then, they're wearing pieces of mail. Mm -hmm. This is a male coat, probably Turkish in its origin, and it weighs 17 pounds. Each of those metal wings are handmade, and then each one is inscribed with the name of a different imam and the name of God, so that the warrior, when he's wearing this male shirt, is protected not only by the armor, but by the name of God as he goes into combat. You have to really, really look close at that. You see now, is it true is. that um, during battles they would actually get individual links pushed into their bodies, it, and it, then that would actually be worse than the injury that they received in battle because of the infections and whatnot? Any type of cut are things. I mean, these are the days before penicillin and even that type of cleanliness mm -hmm. in, in battlefield medicine. Male does great with sword blows and slashes, but any type of crushing damage. Mm -hmm. So if you were wearing a male shirt and someone slashed you with a sword across the arm, you'd be relatively good. If someone hit you with a mace or like a hammer, yeah. it would protect your skin, but it would probably break the bones underneath, even though you're wearing a padded jacket underneath it. Now what about a spear or a lance? It depends on the strength of the, the, the links, uh, but you know. A, a, Those are pretty good links. I, I Those can are, imagine anything you know, breaking that to me. Yeah, but. it's it's pretty strong. It's but remember, just like a bulletproof vest, even though it'll keep the bullet out, okay. there's still that impact that, that can knock you down. And each one is riveted. Yep, each one is riveted, closed, so it gives it a lot more strength. One of our oldest pieces here at the museum is from around 2000 BCE, and this is an ancient Egyptian axe that we, was used in combat. So you can see the handle down at this end, and 
this long, shallow bronze blade. And it's still attached to its wooden, wooden shaft. 4,000 years old. That's the amazing part, that it's still held up, just over, you know? And you know what it's for? <clears throat> now, how do they, is that just wrapped with wire? Is that how they attach yeah, it? Yeah, there, there are holes within the blade itself, and so it's sewn onto the, the handle. And then it's capped with more bronze for strength. Now, is this the oldest piece that the museum has? This is one of the oldest pieces, yeah. And it's the oldest one on display here. Another really iconic piece that lots of people recognize is this helmet for a gladiator from around um, 1000 AD, or, or, or around the first century AD, I'm sorry. And if you remember the Russell Crowe movie, mm -hmm. Gladiator, there's the helmet. Probably only about five or six of those left. And that's not very thick either. No, a lot of this was um, for the gladiatorial games. It's for show mm -hmm. and pageantry. So you can picture this, you know, with, with a, a two-foot horsehair plume coming out of the center of it. But that whole spectacle of, of the warriors out in the middle of the arena. Now, is that a, a Spartan helmet? Yeah, these are uh, Corinthian or Greek helmets. And you, if you, you remember, they're extremely popular here at the museum right after 300 came out. Exactly. So everyone remembers those. Most of the damage you see on them is because of their age, mm -hmm. not necessarily because they were hit in the head with an axe or something. Very cool. Yeah, and they look so simple until you get up close and you can see how the, the eyes are, are, are decorated or they would have had leather sewn on to accent them. Yeah, especially on that one, you can actually see the holes mm -hmm. that they had drilled in around the eyes. Yeah, for the trim work and stuff. Yeah. It's amazing. You know, and even, even the breastplate mimicking the muscles and, and things of, your, of the of the Now, are these chest. all bronze? These are all bronze pieces. You know, from, from the helmets to even the, the spearheads and you know, this sword from about 1300. That's not a very big handle. No, it's, it's used one-handed mm -hmm. um, and for cl up close combat. I'm going to see who you're fighting. This is better. And this whole gallery is all about playing in the Middle Ages. You can learn about castle life, discover what it took to train a war horse, to even read some stories about dragons and princesses. That also reminds me that throughout this entire year, uh, we are open through December 31st. We have special events happening every single month. My favorite day is coming up in August, and that's the first Saturday of August is our medieval hunting animal day. We'll have greyhounds and Irish wolfhounds and ferrets, elk whole falcon show. It'll be a really cool day, so you'll have to come and visit. In fact, come every month. That was day nine. He must have had 20 hits. That's okay. So it's learning for everyone, not just for children. That articulation. So here's the, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, that's okay. the elbow piece, then the leg, the knees, and the sabatons. It's awkward, you know? <laughs> the whole wall of weapons now. Try on a male shirt, but if you get up close, you can see the rivets that you noticed upstairs. 
how each ring is held together. It's amazing. So some defense from 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 point weapons or even crushing damage. <laughs> Shower of of splinters. Now, are these actual lances? These are from uh, a few different time periods and for different types of competitions. Besides just jousting, uh, there were lots of different games that you would play on horseback, whether it's aiming for a target or or grabbing rings off of a rope. Again, to show your prowess. Yeah. And remember, you're not just walking with a stick and trying to hook a ring. You're at a full gallop, at, you know, over 20 miles an hour with you know, this 10 foot long stick aiming for a little circle and trying to grab it. Amazing. While staying on a horse. Right, right. But if you want to see this kind of, of what the lance weighs, so you can pretend to put the, the breastplate on and couch that underneath your arm. So when you're going forward, you're holding it almost vertical, straight up and down. And right before impact is when you lower it down. So even though they have that little cradle, they're still holding. They're still holding a decent amount of weight. Wow, like But you can see where the hook is on this side and then this, this leather ring hits it, and that's how it diverts, you know, it moves the, the force of impact into your breastplate itself. As you think 50 miles an hour on your arm and shoulder would hurt. Well, even just this motion of holding on to it feels unnatural, mm -hmm. you know? Well, when you're in armor and it's actually up underneath your arm, it's a little more comfortable. Okay. And it does feel a little better balanced because this is a static exhibit. You're not getting the full feel of it. Okay. Now, with these actual dusting, this is for uh, <laughs> a, a game from the city of Pisa in Italy, and it's called Giacco del Ponte. Back in the Middle Ages, there were uh, four different big neighborhoods in Pisa that would have uh, kind of like the kids' game, King of the Mountain, mm -hmm. but they do it in the middle of a bridge and they'd wear armor and these club shields and they'd try and knock each other and beat each other up and knock them off the bridge. It became so violent that the Pope set, stepped in and said, hey, no more. <laughs> now they still in Pisa do this game, but it's a tug of war. But they still dress up in the old armor and um, participate today, only a little less bloodthirsty. It just goes to show a different type of tournament that still exists today. And are these original? Yep, these go back to the 1700s, and some of the helmets back to the 1500s. It even shows, you know, the artwork that they did for a game. And just to hit somebody with it. Mm -hmm. Well, you're showing off your colors, your, your, your family's symbols, uh, your uh, 
symbols, your, your neighborhood affiliation. Besides, it gives you something to talk about that when you're drinking wine. It's probably the only way I want to do it. <laughs> this is our auditorium space. In a few short weeks, our summer hours are starting. And so three times a day, there will be arms and armor shows in here, showing how armor was worn, how it was used. The shows are fully interactive. We put people in armor, we hit them with swords, Safely. <laughs> and this is also where our Falcon show will be. Upstairs, we're also talking about the three types of armor that could be worn. So we have your basic combat armor, your armor for ceremony and dress, and then our jousting armor. These are reproductions, but they're really, really well-made reproductions. We also, here at the Higgins Museum, do a full Western martial arts school where we teach everything from Viking axe and shield to the German longsword. So we hand our participants of the class a wooden waster. This is very similar to a training sword that would have been used historically. Mm -hmm. And we do everything from one hour mini workshops to introduce you to the weaponry to a full martial arts school that meets two to three times a week to a summer camp program where kids can sign up for a two hour class that meets five days a week to learn everything from the, the weaponry of Robin Hood, from the, the sword to the dagger mm -hmm. to the pirate cutlass. Wow. And you can see that they do get a, a good working. They get a good working a little bit. Very nice. Now, you mentioned that you have summer hours coming up. What are your summer hours? We do. Well, we're open uh, Tuesday through Saturday, 10 to 4, and Sundays from 12 to 4. And if someone was interested in one of the classes or the summer camp for the kids? Go right to our website at higgins.org, and you can get all the information to our classes as well as the schedule and even register online. Nice. Very impressive. You'll have to come back, and we'll have one of our, our sword masters teach you. That would, be, that would be very cool. I'm not certified, so I'm not going to teach you anything. <laughs> Devin, I want to thank you for taking some time out of your day, take us for a personal tour. Um, you know, I read a lot, and I thought I had a grasp on medieval armor and knights and whatever. I know now that I know nothing. I want to thank you. Um, just once again, could you tell everyone how they can contact the museum for inf information on the classes, any upcoming events they sure. would go to? Well, it was great having you here today, and you have to come back because Definitely. we have six more months of great activities going on, and not one is, can be missed. You can find us on Facebook, just look for the Higgins Armory Museum, but you can also visit us online on the web at www.higgins.org. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. And you're going to be calling the cops because I'm coming back. Well, I'll be a fixture here to get close to us. Well, you're more than welcome. Thank you.